It's not like any other podcast. Coming to you straight from the heartland, where investing is told like it is. It's time for Darren Garman's Paranoid Banker Podcast. Hold on, because here comes the next episode of the Paranoid Banker Podcast. Well, hey everybody, Darren Garman here, and uh, welcome to this week's podcast. And we're going to cover, uh, I guess, one of the most frequently asked questions that I get. Um, and uh, I guess not surprisingly, I get this question more often towards the end of a year and the beginning of a year. Uh, and, and that's not really a surprise because that's when a lot of a lot of folks like you, quite frankly, are making decisions on where they should invest, what should they invest in, if they should move some money around. And a lot of those decisions are made towards the end of the year or the beginning of the year. And so uh, as we start heading towards already um, the end of 2017, uh, this question is is becoming more and more prevalent, and so I thought we probably should have a podcast where I deal with this, and um, and and I think it can help you uh, make some decisions, uh, even if you're not really in the process of making this kind of decision now. Uh, I think this is good information to have and to know, and uh, something to always be considering when the time comes. Uh, to make those decisions. And what I'm really talking about in terms of decision is, um, well, let me back up and let's just let's just make a big assumption um, because the, what this assumption is really the foundation of what this podcast today is going to be about. And that assumption is, you know you should invest in some kind of real estate, okay? Or maybe you are already invested in some kind of real estate. What kind of real estate should it be or what kind of real estate should you maybe be focusing on versus the kind of real estate that you may own right now okay so really at the end of the day the question is what kind of real estate investment assuming that you know you should be either investing in real estate or maybe increasing your real estate holdings or moving your money around with some kind of real estate What kind of real estate makes the most sense for you? And what should you be looking at? And what should you be considering? And so what I'm going to be giving you is my opinion based on, uh, you know, 25 years or so in the investment real estate business, um, being nose to nose and toes to toes, so to speak, with, um, with various uh, major players, minor players, Um, small properties, large properties, uh, you name it. And uh, and so what I'm going to be giving you is really reflective of that and I think can be, um, again, I think can be some good information for you. So let me start out by uh, just jumping in with what I think you should not consider. Um, An investment that you should not consider. And it's not because I think it's bad. Uh, I don't. I don't think it's bad at all. I just don't think it's as competitive as the other three um, uh, the other three ways that I think you should be considering owning the other three ways you should be investing in real estate, which I'm going to get to here in just a second. Um, and, and the investment that I re- that I recommend you do not get involved in is a real estate investment trust, or R E I T, a REIT. Um, and this may surprise some of you, actually, by me mentioning it, because uh, REITs have pretty good reputations, don't they? Uh, for the most part, uh, you know, REITs only borrow up to uh, 50% typically of the asset they purchase. Uh, they usually give pretty consistent um, dividends um, and are usually pretty predictable. Uh, depending on the kind of REIT you invest in. And you've got low risk typically because REITs own a heck of a lot of property, which because of the diversification, um, for most REITs, not all, but for most, you've got a pretty good sense of low, low risk. And so, and the returns usually aren't too bad. Uh, you're typically in the mid to, uh, mid to higher single digit range. Typically, sometimes you might get lucky and maybe have a year here or there. You might even be in the double-digit range. Um, so why in the heck wouldn't I 
I mean, it all sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Why in the heck would I say uh, I don't recommend it? Uh, really, at the end of the day, it's because you don't really own real estate. You own stock in a company that owns real estate. And there's a big difference. So aside from, you know, rate of returns, aside from income that you may be getting from a, let's just say a dividend you may be getting on your stock purchase, you're not getting any, any of the other benefits of owning investment real estate. Okay. All you're getting is really a stock buy. That's all you're really getting. And it's just a stock that owns, a, owns um, again, you're just buying stock in a company that owns real estate. And so it's just a stock play. And if that's all you're really interested in is a stock play, then fine. Um, you've, you've, got, you've got a good investment. But if you're interested in the other avenues that investment real estate can make you money and save you money, it is not the way to go. I'll just give you two quick examples. Um, so when you own a REIT, you cannot get any tax deductions that the investment real estate properties throw off. And many investment real estate properties throw off massive tax deductions. And so it's not uncommon to have income coming in from an investment real estate property you actively own, but show a legal tax loss that shelters that income. That's not really out of the ordinary. Uh, a real estate investment trust cannot do that. A real estate investment trust cannot take advantage of the dynamics of the market in shorter periods of time because of their size. So, in other words, if you owned your own, let's say, uh, let's say you owned your own 12-unit building, uh, you not only get the income from the building, you get all the large tax savings and the equity buildup from the building, but if you get approached by someone that wants to pay you a heck of a lot of money uh, for your building and it's an offer you can't refuse, um, you make the decision, you sell it, and you've made a hell of a lot of money. Well, with a REIT, you can't do any of that. you got big board of directors involved. Um, they're making those decisions for you. Uh, you're not involved in any of those decisions. And so on top of that, you don't get any of those kind of benefits of owning your own property. And so again, I'm not saying that a REIT is the wrong way to go because it's got a lot of advantages. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying for the most part, I don't recommend it as a real estate investment, as a real real estate investment. Okay? All right. Now, let's talk about the three ways that I recommend you own real estate, because this is really going to get um, to the point of the podcast and really uh, get you the information to really kind of chew on and consider. There's really only three ways you can own your very own real estate property. Okay, so let's talk about the first way, and that is buying your own and managing your own property. Let's talk about that, because that is one way. Now. You may be surprised by me saying that because most people that I work with, most investors and most investors that get involved with me year after year, do so because they don't want to be involved in the property. Uh, they don't want to deal with the day-to-day -day management. And that is perfectly fine. However, there are advantages to being involved in owning and running your own property, a lot of them. Um, and so the first one is control, right? So when you own and manage your own property, let's go back to our 12 unit example. Let's say you've got money that you want to invest in real estate and you decide you're gonna own your own 12 unit property, apartment building. So once you buy it, now you're in total control of that building. You control everything. You control the expenses, you control who mows your lawn, you control who removes your snow if you're in a cold climate, uh, you control uh, what the rents are, uh, you control when something gets fixed, who fixes it, how it gets repaired, you control what brand of air conditioning unit you install, you control, I could go on and on, but you get the point. You've got total control, so you make all the calls. And there's a lot of advantages to that, 
a lot of advantages. You're in control. You can make the decisions the way you want to make them. And the bottom line is affected at the end of the day by your decisions. Some of you may think that's great and that's the way you'd want it. Some of you may, I don't really think I really like that. Uh, uh, and with control, uh, there comes management, right? And so the good news is you have control of most all of the decisions. The bad news is you have to deal with the day-to-day -day management. Now, that may not necessarily be bad news. If you're someone that likes property management, it may be good news. So this, it, it may be fine. And heck, knowing that, this could be your preferred method of owning a piece of investment real estate, right? Um but you do have to deal with the management. And by the way, you could make the argument that, well, I'll just hire a management company. They can deal with the management. Then I don't have to deal with the management. Well, I hate to tell you, but even when you do that, you're still involved in the management because there will be decisions that need to be made um, more frequently than you would think where the management company will get in touch with you and say, what do you want us to do? How do you want us to handle this? How do you want to approach it? And so a lot of times investors think when they hire a management company, it's totally hands off and it's not. And it can't be anyway, because you need that management company to perform the way you expect. So the property operates and runs as it should. So not only are you still not, um, stripped away from the management responsibility, you could make the argument you might even have more management responsibility because now you're overseeing the management company and making sure that they're doing the right things day in and day out. Not only taking care of the property, taking care of your residents, but also making sure that your income is as high as it can, the rents are as high as they could possibly be, um, etc. And the list can be long. But at the end of the day, this is a good way to own real estate. And actually, so when I first got into the real estate business, this was me. I did everything. I showed the apartments. I leased the apartments. I did the maintenance and the repair for the most part. There were some things I didn't know how to do and had to bring contractors in, of course. Um, I took the to tenants calls. Uh, I did everything, collected the rents, made the deposits, did the bookkeeping, all of that. And so the good news was I was in control of everything, right? And I could expand that to say the other good news is knowing what I know now, having gone through all of that way back when, helps my decision-making processes with the properties we own now, right? So there's a heck of a lot of advantages, but it's control is the main advantage, number one, okay? That is the main advantage is control. And so if you're an investor that wants to invest in their own real estate properties, you know it's the way to go. Um, you know you should be diversifying or at least investing some of your money, whether regular or IRA money, um, and control is very, very important to you, then you should look at owning your own real estate property and either managing it yourself or bringing in a property management company that you would basically oversee management of that property. Okay. All right. So that's number one. Number two recommendation for owning investment real estate would be in a partnership. Okay. Um, but here's the difference though. The partnership, you own a single property. Okay. So it's just like this pretty easy. Uh, you and five of your friends uh, get together and you decide you want to own some real estate. Uh, a 72 unit apartment property comes available. You and five of your buddies decide to pull your money together and buy the property. And uh, now after you buy the property, you're going to have uh, one of your partners, one of your buddies. Uh, it doesn't have to be a friend. It can be professional, of course. Um, we'll just call him your partner. Uh, one of your five partners is going to oversee the management. So you don't have anything to do with the day-to-day -day management of the property, 
but you've got a pretty good direct link towards the people that do. Um, not a bad way to own real estate. And so I'll give you an analogy. So I, uh, I have a few investment real estate properties that I own individually with other partners. Okay, one is a 160 plus unit property that I own with 10 other partners. Okay, and that's all we own. So our partnership only owns this one property. So the good news is I don't necessarily deal with the day-to-day -day management of this property. I have an asset manager that does that. I don't have to worry about inspecting the property. I don't have to worry about housing codes. I don't have to worry about making the loan payment. I don't have to worry about the bookkeeping. I don't have to worry about the day-to-day -day operations of this 160-unit property. I don't have to worry about it at all. Uh, but I have a direct connection to the person that does have to worry about it, that is taking care of all of those things, and even more than I actually mentioned. And I can check in. I can ask questions. I can get information most any time I really want regarding anything I'm concerned about. Also, do I want to drop in and maybe inspect a few units just to see what they look like? Sure, no problem. Uh, do I want to walk the grounds and the common areas sometime and just check things out, see how things are going? Sure, I can do that. Uh, and so I still have a good investment. I still have a good connection with the people that are making the decisions, but I don't have the control that I would have if I own my own property. Right. So as I said, there's 10 of us. So any kind of major decision that needs to be made, it's the majority that rules. And it's, by the way, majority of ownership, not majority of numbers. So basically 50, per, 50 plus percent ownership makes the decision. So let me give you a quick example. Um, let's say we get approached by some company that wants to pay an outrageous price for our property. They, they say, hey, we want to buy it. Do you want to sell? Well, now we need to talk to all 10 of the partners to see if we want to sell. Um, and let's say, the again, the price is outrageous. But if 50 plus percent of our partners don't think it is and have no interest in selling, guess what? Even though I want to sell, even though I'm interested in selling, we're not going to be selling the property. Uh, here's another example. We recently had um, some capital improvements that we did. We put new decks on these units, and it was a $200,000 plus improvement cost. Okay, well, the majority of the owners decided that that's what we wanted to do. Now, let's say I was one of those owners that said, no, I don't want to do that. I think that's a waste of money. Well, too bad because the majority of the owners decided that that's the way to go. Now, here's the good news about this. Even though you don't nearly have as much control as you do by owning your own property, when you get involved in partnerships like this, most of the time, everybody's pretty much on the same page. So rarely is there any kind of big, what I would call, partner conflict when someone just absolutely uh, passionately feels this way about something or that way about something and there's big disagreements and there's a lot of back and forth and maybe even a little bit of conflict. Rarely does that happen. Uh, mainly because most investors are on the same page in terms of doing the necessary things to make the property as valuable and get it to produce as much income as possible. Right? But the disadvantage is you don't, tip it, you don't have total control even though you do have a connection with those that have control. Unlike, let's say, a real estate investment trust, right? So uh, do you think that the CEO of the real estate investment trust is going to take your call and talk to you about um, you not liking the investments that they're choosing? Of course not. Uh, whereas when in a partnership, I mean, you got to say so. You can call the asset manager. You can call the manager of the partnership. You can send in an email and say, hey, I'm concerned about X, Y, or Z. Or, hey, why did we decide to do X, Y, or Z? Now you can at least get some answers. You see that? You can at least have some 
participation in it versus your voice not being heard at all. Though, albeit on a limited basis versus owning your own property. So that's the second way is being involved in a partnership that frees you from that day-to-day -day management responsibility, but still you are still involved as an investor. And here's the other nice thing, by the way. Remember, you still get all the active owner benefits as if you own the property yourself. Don't forget that. Okay, When you're in a partnership that owns the property, you still get all of the tax deductions, all the write-offs, all the value increases, all the equity gains, all of those same benefits you would get as if you own the property yourself. Don't forget that. Okay, You just have a little bit less control from a management standpoint. All right. Um, then there's the third, the third way, and that is being involved in an active owner real estate fund. Um, and a good example is the Heartland Flagship Fund. Uh, that's a really good example where the fund doesn't own one properties. The fund owns many, many properties. And so you're an active owner of many, many properties all at the same time. And I want to emphasize you're an active owner. And so, again, at the risk of uh, repeating myself, you're not just owning one property. You're making an investment to own many properties at one time. OK, um, many people prefer this. Uh, the majority of investors that I work with prefer this. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily I'm not necess necessarily uh, there we go, necessarily saying that it's the way everybody should invest. Um, but it does have its, its advantages. And so the advantages are, of course, uh, just like an individual partnership purchase. You don't have any management responsibilities. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the advantage is you still have a connection. You still have a, what I would call say-so. You still have communication and rapport with the person that runs the partnership. Okay, so with the Heartland Flagship Fund, any partners in that fund can contact me anytime with questions, thoughts, comments, etc. Um their communication with me will not fall on deaf ears. And that's a big advantage because you're still connected with the person that's making the decisions. Another advantage is, um, is really risk level. So when you have 30 plus apartment and commercial properties like we do, that kind of diversification can really be good. In terms of risk, and so um, you compare that to your individual property ownership. And so, if the 12 unit property we talked about before has a bad year, um, you you may you may have the um, you may have the consequences of having a bad year. Your occupancy's down. Maybe your expenses are up. Some surprise capital improvements came up. Heck, you can maybe have a loss maybe a year or two here or there if you own your 12-unit property, if these kinds of things come up. Well, when you own an interest in a fund like I'm talking about, you could have two, three, or four properties that may not do well for whatever reason, occupancy issues, maybe surprise capital improvements, but you're going to be typically just fine. Because the other properties float those boats, so to speak. Okay, um, And the same thing applies the other way, though, too. So let's say in our fund, let's say 20 out of the 30 properties produce a 15% return this year. But let's say 10 out of the 30 properties produce only a 2% return. Well, those 10 properties this year kind of drug down everything else. So now our 15% return is really going to be closer to probably a 5 or a 6 or maybe a 7% return. That is another reality of it as well. Okay. However, remember, you still are away from all of the management day to day. You still have contact with the person making the decision. However, here's the big difference. When decisions are made they're made by the manager and you do not have a say so in those decisions in a large fund. Okay, so like an individual property partnership, you kind of have a say so. 
even though the majority rules in that case, um, you still have a say-so. Um, in a fund, you don't have a say-so. So when the manager of the fund, like if, for example, I, with our Heartland flagship fund, if I decide we're going to sell one of our assets, we're going to sell one of our properties. Okay. If I decide that we're going to um, put some, do some capital improvement work to a handful of properties, we're going to do some capital improvement work to a handful of properties. And so when you get involved in that kind of investment that owns that much in terms of that, those, you know, that many assets, you are turning the control and the decision making over to the person that is running and managing the fund. Okay, and you're basically saying, you know what's in the best interest of the fund. I am going to go ahead and understand that you're going to be consistently working on the best interest of the fund, which includes my best interest as well. Now, here's a big, big key to this. This has got to be the case in any kind of fund, like the Heartland Flagship Fund, for example, that you decide to get involved in. Okay, here it is. The person running the fund, making the decisions on the day-to-day -day basis, has to have their own money in the fund as well. Okay? Has to. For obvious reasons, right? So I have skin in the game with the Heartland Investment Flagship Fund. So any decision I make affects me. Big time. Any kind of decision I make, uh, the fund does well. I'm affected. The fund does poorly. I'm affected too. You do not, do not, do not ever want to get involved in any kind of real estate investment with somebody that's managing it that does not have their own money in that investment. You never want to do that. Because at the end of the day, your money is not as important to them. Okay? It's not. And so you need to make sure that if you get involved in any kind of real estate investment, and in this case I'm talking about a large partnership or fund that owns dozens or even more than that in terms of holdings or properties, the person running the show, managing it, needs to have their own money in it. Make sure you find that out before you get involved. Okay? Um, and so those are the three ways, the three methods that I recommend you own investment real estate. All three of them have advantages and disadvantages, um, for sure. And really, your preference is going to be based on a variety of things, and we can make a long list of what those things are as they pertain to you personally, of course. Um, but those are the three ways I recommend. And I really recommend making a decision on one of those three methods sooner versus later. You know, because a lot of us sit on the fence. We know we should be doing something. Like in this case, well, I should be owning some investment real estate. But there's always that gap of time between knowing you should do something and actually doing it. I can tell you the writing is on the wall in terms of what I consider the coming profitability of investment real estate, specifically multifamily. And not that multifamily isn't profitable now. It will be ever more the case as time goes by, especially based on where things are headed demographically and economically in terms of people wanting to, needing to, and having to, and choosing to rent versus own. Okay, so that's my long-winded way of saying do something right away. <laughs> Gets going now on this. Don't put it off uh, at all. Uh, get involved in one of those three kind of investments as soon as you can. All right. Hey, look, if you've got any questions about anything I've mentioned on this on this episode, this podcast episode, uh, feel free to fire me off an email. would be happy to hear from you. Uh, get your comments would be good and respond to you. I would, uh, I would definitely look forward to it. And so we've talked about the kind of investment real estate I think you should avoid. And we've talked about the kind of investment real estate um, opportunities that I think you should get involved in. Okay? Bottom line is get involved in one of them sooner versus later. All right, everybody. 
hey, have a great day. I'm sure we'll be talking to you soon. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining Darren Garman's Paranoid Banker Podcast. For investment questions, comments, or to get in touch with Darren, go to www.garmanblog.com.